turn to page four in your packet, we're gonna spend some time digging into what it is we believe. Now, we are part of the Evangelical Free Church of America. The EFCA is comprised of something like 1,500 churches divided among 17 districts across the United States. So we are a part of the North Central District, which contains most of the churches in the state of Minnesota. But we also have a global impact. We have almost 650 missionaries in almost 60 countries. If you have more questions or want to learn more about this movement, go to efca.org. Now, there is often some confusion in relation to our name. What does it mean that we are evangelical free? Well, it's two separate ideas. The first is that we are evangelicals. That is that we believe the gospel is of first importance. Uh, The free part is just in reference to our polity. So each one of our churches is free in regards to state rule, to higher up rule. Each church owns and operates its own building. Now, we also agree that we are going to surround ourselves and center ourselves around our 10-point statement of faith, which is what every church that we have uh, believes and agrees with. So there have been three revisions to our statement of faith. When we were founded in 1950, we had one statement of faith that was revised in 2008 and most recently updated in 2019. So we'll be digging into the 2019 edition here today. But there's a couple mottos that I think would be helpful for you to know that kind of serve as as the base for how the EFCA operates and goes about our business. The first is that we are comprised of all believers, but believers only. That means that we don't take statements on things that have a tendency to divide other churches. Things like baptism, age of the earth, knowing uh, when Christ will return. But we also want to major on the majors and minor on the minors. That means that if there's an issue that is of first importance, something like the virgin birth, we're going to emphasize and believe that. But there's, if there's something that is of secondary importance, then we're going to make it a minor issue and agree not to divide over it. This is stated in a passage like 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul reminds us, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That is what Paul is saying is of first importance, and that is what we try to emphasize here in the EFCA, is that which is of first importance. Now we're going to briefly go through our 10-point statement of faith, and I will explain some things a little bit beyond uh, what, what is just said in the statement. But if you want to dig into this further, this is one of those books that I recommended at the beginning. It's called Evangelical Convictions, which walks through in great detail what it is that we believe, in greater detail than I have time to go in with these videos. Now just so you know, the, these 10 points are an attempt to explain what the Bible speaks to which means, by definition, it is a work of systematic theology. I was one time discussing this with a friend who, as he was studying the statement of faith, said, I can't believe how succinctly they captured everything. Another friend described this book as dense, like pound cake. There's a lot to it that we get to dig into. So we'll just be scratching the surface on a lot of these issues. Again, if you want to dig further into it, get this book, Evangelical Convictions. Let's begin with point number one. We believe in one God creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing, in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory. We begin this whole statement of faith by saying, We believe which is our attempt to stand with the historic creeds and confessions of the historic Christian faith. But we also need to ask the question, why do we begin here and what does it communicate? See, with most systematic theologies, there's two places you can start, either with God or with the Bible. We begin here with God because this we believe that the Bible comes out of understanding of who God is. It's also where the Bible begins. So the Bible says, in the beginning, God, in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It also says that we believe in one God. Not many gods, not three gods, one God. Think of the Shema, which is what an an ancient Israeli person would have memorized, what Jesus would have memorized as he was growing up in Deuteronomy 6, where they would recite this every day, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This also tells us that he has no parts. This is getting to the doctrine of simplicity. There is no one else like him. 
Also, as we saw in our discussion of the gospel, he is the creator of all things. Again, the first thing we see God doing in the Bible is creating. We also know that this creation took place ex nihilo. That is a Latin phrase which just means from nothing. We see that in Hebrews 11.3 where it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. That means that, that this creation idea is beyond the realm of scientific discovery. What we are united under is the fact that God is our creator. We can divide, but not not completely divide over how, the means by which he created. That means we are not taking a position on age of the earth. This also points us to God being a God of order. He ordered everything. This also says that we are not Platonists. C.S. Lewis said, God likes matter. He invented it. We also say that God is holy. That idea is that he is separate, that he is unique, he is transcendent, above and beyond us. We see in a passage like Isaiah 6.3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. But then we also have the reality that because God is holy, we as Christians are commanded to live holy lives. We see that first show up in Leviticus 19.2, but then it's repeated again in 1 Peter 1.16. We are commanded to be holy just like God our Father in heaven is holy. It also says that he is infinitely perfect. That means he is not bound by space and time. There's no deficiency. There's no lack in him. This is getting to the idea that God is self-sufficient, or the theological term is aseity. He is not dependent on anyone or anything. It also says that he is loving. God is love. But it's important to note that his love is not in contradiction to or opposed to his holiness. That doctrine of simplicity means that God is both holy and loving. Those things are wedded together. You cannot separate those two ideas. It also says that God is triune, three equally divine persons. Now, the word Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. It is a theological term used to describe the reality that we see the way God describes himself in the Bible. One God in three persons, which means that in himself, by his definition, God is a relational being. It also says he has limitless knowledge and sovereign power. There is an interplay somehow in some way between God's plans and our choices, but we know that somehow in some way nothing can thwart God's purposes. It also says that he has graciously purposed to redeem a people. He saves us individually, but then draws us, brings us into his family. And ultimately, he will make all things new for his own glory. That all things new gets us to there's cosmological implications to the gospel message. We saw that when we were discussing our gospel section. We also see at the very end, for his own glory. That's where you you may have heard that Bach signed all his pieces at the end, SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. That's the aim of all of our lives. That's the aim of why God created us, is to ultimately bring him glory. So that's what we seek to do in everything that we do. Number two, the Bible. We believe that God has spoken in the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, through the words of human authors. As the verbally inspired word of God, the Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation, and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. Francis Schaeffer wrote a book last century titled, He is There and He is Not Silent. Everything points us to him, but ultimately, God has revealed himself to us through his word. And and God's first act in the Bible is speaking in Genesis 1, but he also speaks to his creation. And finally, the consummation of history was pointing to that time when the word would finally become flesh. So the beginning of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. But we also see that both Old and New Testaments are completely inspired. Marcion uh, was someone who was labeled a heretic in the second century. He tried to jettison, to divorce, to separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. 
He said that the God of the Old Testament was judgeful and wrathful, and the God of the New Testament is all love, which sounds like a lot of pastors today. Just so you know, in the second century, the idea that we can separate the Old and New Testaments from each other was labeled a heresy and remains a heresy today. Now, there are two key passages that you need to know in this doctrine of of, of what we believe about the Bible. The first is 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Second is 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, where Peter says, No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What this is getting at is God used specific people at specific times to write what he wanted written and how he wanted it written. We, as as the EFCA, believe in verbal plenary inspiration. We'll just work through those three words. Verbal. We believe that God speaks. In fact, there are certain and specific cases throughout Scripture we have, where we have the very words of God recorded. Places like Habakkuk 2 and Jeremiah 30. The second word is plenary, so verbal plenary. Plenary just means it's the primary, the highest authority. Third word, inspiration. Verbal plenary inspiration. The Word of God is inspired by God. We also believe that it is without error in its original writings. That is getting to the doctrine of inerrancy. Now, often you'll hear me pray after I have read Scripture before us, God, we thank you that your word is inspired, inerrant, and authoritative. So because God's word is our ultimate authority, one of the the doctrines that came out of the, the Reformation is sola scriptura. Everything else is subservient. Now, you already heard me say this phrase. I'm going to say it again, though. Norma normans, non normata. The norming norm that cannot be normed, or the ruling rule that cannot be ruled. This is getting to what do we view as our highest authority? Is it the Declaration of Independence? Is it the Magna Carta? No! For those of us who are in Christ, our highest authority out of everything else in the world is God's Word. That's what we always need to be coming back to and reminding ourselves what it says and what it teaches. This also leads us to the last sentence where in our statement of faith we say, It is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. So we believe it. We live it. We depend on it. Everything in it is profitable. Yes, even the names, the list of names that are in there are profitable, according to Paul, which means we need to be spending time studying it. I remember a sermon one time I was listening to by Pastor John Piper, where he said, I can't guarantee you will grow from reading the Bible, but I can guarantee that you will not grow apart from reading the Bible. The point is, spend time in God's Word. See, all of us as Christians know the direction of all of human history. That's the point of the book of Revelation. It gives us comfort in the midst of everything else that's going on around us. We know that God has a plan and a purpose for everything, even our suffering. So use any of the suffering that you have right now as an experience, as an opportunity to grow closer to God, because we know the end. We know our outcome is secure.